Hey everyone, Ryan here with Plague Size Studios, and on this Gear Curiosities deep dive, we're taking a look at the amp modeler that was all the rage when I started playing guitar, the Pod X3. This video is brought to you by Chariotone and the Gargoyle Tube Amplifier Head. Combining the best features of British and American amp designs, the newest member of the Hot Rod at Plexi cramps 50 years of iconic rock and metal tones into a single channel platform while costing only a fraction of the competition. From classic tube breakup to face melting high gain, this 50 watt beast delivers the goods without skimping on the bells and whistles. Preamp toggle switches, effects loop, line out, it's all here. Well, except for this fabulous stainless steel finish. That will cost you extra. Secure your gargoyle today at the link below. The Pod X3 is a fascinating example of corporate marketing and even engineering progression in a way that we've not really seen repeated since its release in 2007, uh, at least in the sense of amp modeling technology. And I think that if Line 6 or any other company for that matter were to do some of the similar things uh, to what they did with this release, they'd probably be crucified online by the review scene. Um, but because a lot of that didn't exist, there was no such thing as, you know, independent online reviewers um, in, you know, the YouTube sense that we have now, then you just kind of had to rely on Guitar Player Magazine and the, the few demos you might spot. Um, but at the same time, I feel with the X3, this is the product Line 6 wanted to make with the XT. Um, and then some of the additional features I feel were really add-ons to incentivize those who already owned an X. T to upgrade. I will no doubt be mixing the, the two names up because XT, X3, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna mess me up a few times, I have a feeling. But for those that don't know, the XT originally released in 2002 with the X3 family of products following up five years later in 2007. Though you could continue to buy XT products like the, the Bean and the Rack Mount Pro and the floorboards. And the reason that is because they actually shared the same architecture. They're the same ant modeling and effects algorithms, which is weird, you know, when viewing this through a modern lens, because that's kind of the time span you would expect a full generation to last. Um, whether we're talking about ant modelers like the Axe FX3 following up the Axe FX2 or smartphones or computer hardware or video game consoles, like five years is pushing it to be on you know, one platform, and then to take that and relaunch it with a little more power under the hood and basically stick with that for what was it, another four years, something like that. So they were riding on their same baseline algorithms, their, the same work they laid out with the XT for going on a decade. Um, and that's, uh, in a way it speaks to, I guess, what they were able to achieve. It's definitely noteworthy. I think this was a symptom of a lack of any real amp modeling competition at that time. I mean, you had Zoom, you had Digitech, but these were things that weren't really adopted by pro users much. This was pre axe FX, pre Kemper. So there wasn't much pressure on Line 6 to, you know, reinvent the wheel. Um, their best strategy at that point was just to kind of take all the work, all the the things they created and, and pack it into one package, make it a better value, and try to sell it based off that. But in doing so, they continued down this path of making the pod look, well, less and less like a pod, besides the overall shape, and even that's changed slightly. I mean, it, it, it really doesn't look much like the original or 2.0, and it certainly doesn't function that way. So we'll talk about those things that it does well, um, its strengths and weaknesses, as always, and and uh, how it compares to the previous generations. So first things first, because this shares the same modeling engines and architecture as the XT, presets are actually interchangeable between the two. So if you go to like find all your Line 6 presets on the website or you have some old ones from the XT, you can import it on an X3 and it works. As you might expect, it sounds pretty much identical. Um, the thing is there are some slight differences say take a high gain patch versus an identical high gain patch on the xt you might hear something resembling an eq difference maybe some high-end dynamics and 
I, uh, I assume that's coming from firmware updates that this device has received that the XT has not. Um, the, the presets, the overall updates for this is more recent comparatively. Um, you can, you know, compare it between like the latest firmware on Axe FX2 versus the latest firmware on AX8. They're the same, you know, baseline hardware. They're the same kind of um, firmware and modeling engine, but just those small tweaks will make even the same technology sound just slightly different. But for the most part, all the sounds you could get on the XT, you can get on this thing. So at this point, any rational XT owner would ask, why on earth would you upgrade to a device that, for all intents and purposes, sounds identical to the one you already own? And frankly, there's plenty of use cases um, where, depending on what you need out of your device and depending on how much you've invested into the XT, it would not make sense to upgrade. But there are a few things that this does that any new buyer at the time or you know, someone who's looking at this use, it, this can be a, a sizable increase in power and usability. So the first thing is this is actually about double the processing power of the XT, and that allows you to run what is basically two presets at the same time. That's why you have this tone one and tone two button. So every time you go to a preset screen, say if you're starting on one A, you'll see you actually have two almost like scenes that you would find on other amp modelers. And you can do a couple different things with this. So you can play one tone at a time and have you know two independent stereo signal paths that are ready to change. So say you got a clean tone in one and your dirty rhythm tone in the other one. You can hard pan each one left and right. So say you want a, you know, a certain high gain amplifier on the left and a different model on the right for a larger stereo image. Maybe add a slight bit of delay on one side to give that Haas effect or you can combine the two and play them at the same time. So you can, you know, maybe have an edge of breakup on top of a clean sound for, you know, kind of a, a bigger overall image, or you can actually use independent inputs and outputs. So say you have one guitar signal chain and the other one, you plug in a, a microphone cable coming from an acoustic guitar. So you can have two instruments processed at the same time. Likewise, any instrument or microphone for that matter that's XLR capable can plug into the Pod X3 and you can process your vocals simultaneously with the guitar. So if you're a singer songwriter, you can play an acoustic instrument and put your microphone into this or if you're even playing high gain guitar, you can do the same thing, or even for recording applications. Of course, that wouldn't matter much if you didn't have the modeling capability to support it, but in addition to all the guitar effects and amplifiers, they actually added on all of the bass amp packs that you would find on the XT generation, as well as some vocal preamps and effects. So you've got some like American vintage, modern type preamp sounds, and um, they work, as you'll see in a couple of the uh, demonstrations. And then finally, since this is a bass and guitar and vocals thing all in one, they decided, you know what, let's put everything on here. So all of those packs from the XT generation, the effects junkies, the amp models, everything that you could have bought standalone is 
found on this hardware. So if you weren't already an owner of an XT, and that applies to today, and you wanted to use one of those expansion packs, say you wanted to have that pre-EQ pedal, or you wanted to use a, a diesel amp model, by the time you bought one or especially two of those, you're way better off just getting this, uh, especially with the IO improvements, especially already having the bass and vocal capability, and what I find is an improved interface. So they definitely ramped up the value with this release. The rest of the IO doesn't see much of a change. We still have the same bulky power adapter, same instrument input, headphone output, two quarter inch lines out for going into an interface or tube amp or any power amp for that matter effects return. But uh, we do see a couple additions that are quite nice. First of all, we've got SVDIF out, which I always like to see because it's digital. Um, it cuts down on any analog conversion, which is always good. And the USB interface is now USB 2.0, which again, will allow you to plug directly into a computer, record through that, use it as your audio interface in general. And uh, that would obviously save you some cost and some headaches if you're just starting out as a you know, recording musician. The front panel and control section received a much more dramatic facelift, starting with this kind of fitting candy apple red finish. Uh, and in an era of Motorola Razor phones, this actually didn't stick out all that bad. It does look a bit more like a toy in that way, especially when you combine it with these chrome Mesa Boogie-like knobs that are admittedly harder to see where you're at. Uh, but, you know, it is a product, a product of its time, what can you say? The center is definitely the bigger improvement where the relatively narrow screen of the XT gets replaced with this still low resolution screen, but it is much more usable. You can see your entire signal chain from the home screen with a couple taps on the directional pad um, or even getting to uh, some of the screens by quickly double tapping these. You can see pretty much all the parameters you need to per section. So, you know, like the amp screen, I think does take up to where you'll change the model, scroll down a row to change the cabinet, scroll over one page for all the EQ and stuff, which will automatically bring you there with these controls. Um, and then you have the same sort of screen for modulation delay, all that good stuff. And a few of those things you can move pre or post, but the signal path generally lies in, in the same order, which does simplify some things, um, but it does limit you on you know some of the modularity not a big deal for me for what this product is trying to achieve. I'm not expecting, you know, these big parallel paths and, and all that crazy stuff. It is still a pod at the end of the day. Like the XT, practically all of these auxiliary controls are menu dependent. So say you're in the delay screen, this one might control feedback, one might control the level, this will control which model it is, whether you're on a you know, mono tape versus a, a stereo um, analog version. And with that, it kind of renders a lot of these physical tone stack controls obsolete because you can even do a lot of that with the amplifiers as well. So this is yet an, another way that the pod series has progressed where this is just kind of pointless. Uh, besides changing the tone volume, this is kind of like your channel volume for each um, scene in one preset. So you can have tone two be louder than tone one if tone two is your vocals and turn tone one is your guitars, for instance. Um, the reverb still does the thing, but given how many reverb models there are and all the controls there, you're better off going to the reverb section to edit that. Uh, they move the master volume over to here, which is kind of weird. Uh, it makes more sense over next to the uh, headphones, in my opinion. Uh, but the, the rest of it just, you know, it, it's so menu dependent, so contextual, where you'll rarely be using these, I find. Coming from the XT, I found the control layout to be not super intuitive at first, but within 15 to 20 minutes, I was comfortable enough that I didn't really feel the, the need to pull up amp modeling software to make this happen. The main advantage to using something like Gearbox is being able to rename things more easily, um, being able to see the entire list of ant models instead of scrolling through them individually. That's a big time saver, being able to more easily enable disable blocks and move them in pre-post configuration. So if you're you know, really trying to tweak something, Gearbox is the way to go, but I still think this is a more or less usable interface um, that they have on the front. Definitely good enough for you know some last minute tweaking if you're in a recording or even live environment. And that's something I can't even say about like the AX8. I edit all of that uh, via computer 
and the you know kind of physical amp controls I'll just leave for playing out loud in a room. As with any amp modeling product, the greatest power lies in being able to create your own presets. But presets are important. They're not something I would score a product on um, just because it has bad presets or whatever, but it, it does give a valuable first impression to someone who doesn't want to just, you know, deep dive into making their own stuff immediately. If you just want to plug in and see what kind of sounds are available on hardware like this, especially if you're demoing in a store or it's the first, you know, five minutes you're trying it out, then those first impressions matter. And my biggest gripe with the XT was that they're all classic rock focused. Uh, there's a couple high gain things here and out, you know, here and there, but none of them sounded good. Um, the, the clean and breakup stuff was a little generic and uh, the rest of the ones that are song specific, again, were catering towards a certain crowd, which at the time I, I get, it, it made sense. Um, and I, I think it did show off some of the strengths. The problem I take with the presets on here is that they are so gimmicky. There's some of it that, um, you know, would legitimately work. I would use and, and tweak if I needed, say, a clean jazz sound or um, a ring modulator sound for some reason. But for the most part, um, there, it's that mixture of like a few classic rock focus presets and then just write offs after that. Um, and I much prefer the way that someone like Fractal Audio has done with their more recent products where it's like, here's a bank of 64 presets or whatever. And it's like playing through a different guitar rig on every one of them. It's like, okay, you want a diesel sound? Here's a diesel rig, a few pedals that make sense. And it's up to you to turn those on or off. You know, we'll assign some different scenes, but um, here's a sound. Here's a Fender Blues Junior rig. Here's a 5150 rig. Here's a Plexi rig. And that is so much more useful uh, for being able to demo a product, be able to use it as a real guitarist would, would use a real rig. Um, so I feel, again, in the presentation of this device, it's like, ooh, look at all the processing power we have comparatively. Look at all the fun, cool sounds you can use. Not that you'll actually play with this 90% of the time, but you know, here you go. Um, and I won't be showing the vocals or bass presets, but that's kind of my takeaway from it. But for the sake of completion, you know, I gotta show them anyway. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.
listening to those presets for the first time, I was neither blown away nor really disappointed. It's because it sounds like an XT. Uh, if you put those presets on an XT, that's what I would expect it to hear. It's nothing really new coming from that. There were some different tonal palettes with the new effects packs and amp packs that I didn't buy on the XT, so that was an okay surprise. But the thing that I wanted this to be able to excel at, that the XT could not, given its limitations, uh, without at least spending more money on it, is that ultra processed high gain guitar tone that so many of us reveled in in that time period. You know, everyone who was starting out home recording around that time, this is the tones I'm talking about. Um, modeling off of albums such as Meshuggah's Catch 33 or Animals as Leaders first album or uh, Monuments or even Devin Townsend's Ziltoid, which uh, I mentioned in the last XT video, but uh, you actually use an X3. I can get that same sort of sound on the stock hardware though. Um, so I wanted to see if those added effects, if the added uh, amp models, specifically like the big bottom, um, the chunk, there's a, a couple like the diesel VH4, the Bogner Ubershaw, that kind of stuff that was absent from the stock XT. I wanted to see if, if that could achieve those ultra high gain sounds, those that visceral, um, perfected kind of digital tone. Uh, that I would have been happy to record or even even gig with. So let's have at it. I think I would call that a success and don't get me wrong this isn't necessarily like a replacement for a real guitar rig like I would view something like an Axe FX or even a Kemper as uh, for my own personal rhythm guitar sound I would much rather plug into one of these amps behind me uh, and mic up a cabinet or go through a quality impulse response and that to me is the real deal this is a cool sound though um, and, and I think it does have that advantage of differentiating itself um, to where it's not quite stepping on the toes of real gear or some higher end products. It's still a very specific sound. Um, and, and I like it. Again, it, it's uh, one of those things that if I hadn't grown up listening to that kind of stuff, probably not. Um, I didn't listen to a whole lot of like the Swedish chainsaw metal sound either growing up. And because of that, I'm not a huge fan of the Boss HM2 thing. Some people are, um, but I can get why, you know, this might have been a formative sound to some people because it was for me. And I honestly think some of the tones in the box between the admittedly weak cabinet 
models and the post EQ, it kind of makes up for the limitations that are in the amplifier modeling. It doesn't sound super authentic, but it does sit well enough in a mix um, that you know you can do some post work on it and, and make it all right. With that said, just like previous generations of pods, and especially because this shares the same compatibility and architecture as the XT, this lacks any dedicated power amp modeling, which means the sound you're hearing is literally just a preamp going through a cabinet, which is not realistic whatsoever. You're not getting any of the power amp sag. There's no tube breakup at higher volumes, none of that stuff, uh, none of the resonance. And because of that, it is a bit of a, a sanitized sound, something that you wouldn't normally hear. It does sound kind of like a distortion pedal with a, an EQ curve over top of it, which again, can work for, for what that is. But um, for that reason, it, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. So what a lot of people would do, as they would with the XT or original pods, is put this through a tube power amp and mic'd up cabinet for either recording or touring application. So with that, let's hear what one of the 5150 amp models sounds like going through an EL34 power amp into a V30 speaker. Of course, we'll be using a single SM57 just because it's, it's easy. <laughs> Not necessarily because it sounds all that great. <laughs> Now that is a much more authentic sound to my ears, and if you hadn't have told me that that was a digital preamp, I probably wouldn't have guessed that. So this definitely makes it a worthwhile setup if you want to have an all-in-one kind of pedal board and preamp sound, and then use another you know rig to make it loud. And I think that's a very viable use case. Another thing I'll say is the amp models that I did test with the metal pack specifically, they do react much better to tube power amps and real cabinets compared to a lot of the stock models on the XT. I find I did not like the sound of the rectifier preamp through a power amp. It just, it didn't sound like a rectifier. It, it sounded like a, a cheap imitation of it. Whereas this, it's like, oh yeah, I can, I can see where they're coming from. It ain't perfect, but uh, yeah, that's kind of a diesel sound. That's kind of a Bogner sound. That's kind of a Marshall sound. So um, for that setup specifically, I, I actually quite liked it. However, it's fairly ignorant to assume that someone who would be shopping for a relatively budget-friendly amp modeler would also have a power amp and 4x12 setup, especially given this thing's $100 or, or so used price today. So with that, the more likely thing you are to do is disable the onboard cabinet modeling and use an external impulse response. This is something I didn't actually explicitly test with the XT because I thought the high gain amps that I actually liked the best still didn't sound great through a real cabinet. So it's a pretty good indication of how it would sound in you know digital form. But I, I honestly think the model packs do a better job in general so, you know, hopefully with that, they will sound better with impulse responses. So let's take that same 5150 preamp sound, put it through the Greenback and SN57 cabinet model on board and compare that with a mostly equivalent own hammer impulse response, also using Greenbacks and an SN57 from an Uber cab. And then for the cherry on top, we'll see what this would have sounded like maybe with power amp simulation and we'll use the Ignite Amps TPA1 plugin for that using the 6L6 uh, tube driven mode. <laughs> ¶¶ 
that couldn't have been much more of a night and day difference if you tried. And even excluding the power amp discussion for a moment, just looking at the impulse response, you know, it's one of those things where I don't really care if an amp modeler is 100% accurate on all fronts if all the components play well together. You know, I'm okay if, say, because this doesn't have power amp modeling, if they took the cab models and did some EQ manipulation to, to kind of make up for that difference, that'd be great. Or if they did some other things to make up for some of the limitations of the preamp, that, that's also fine as long as it sounds okay together. But in this case, it's like they've got a good preamp sound, but it's ruined by the cabinet comparatively. Once you hear the comparison to a quality impulse response, it's weird. It's like they haven't updated that sound since, you know, maybe the pod 2.0 days. And that's, that's what they stock pair with this. It's not like I've specifically chose the worst sounding impulse response. That's what they put on the 5150 when you choose the amp modeler. So obviously someone thought that was what it should have sounded like. And then you put a power amp sound on top of that and you get that resonance. You get kind of the scooped out low mids. You get some uh, that sag squishiness from the power supply. And it's like sort of authentic. I wouldn't have guessed that was from a pod preamp. Um, so I guess the major takeaways is the cabinets are really weak compared to everything else on here. It's doable. Again, you've got some post EQ you can work with. Once you record it, you can do some other manipulation. But with other high quality modelers out there and even compared to plugins today, you just don't have to do pretty much any of that stuff. Um, and I found even with the older 1.0 and 2.0 pods, they didn't play well with impulse responses. The best case scenario for that was putting it through a real power ramp and speaker, in my opinion. The cabinet model quality wouldn't necessarily be that big of a sticking point for me if this could load its own impulse responses, but as you probably know, neither the XT nor the X3 or even the HD series allows you to do that. Not surprising considering you didn't see that feature on, you know, uh, for many years on even budget amp modelers. So um, it's not a big deal for those that are kind of using this directly with a computer uh, because you can always monitor through another interface and put impulse responses on after the fact, but if you're using like an X3 Live 4 board straight to the desk, you better hope they have some decent post EQ uh, features on their mixer because you're stuck with the, the sound you get. For Live, not a, the biggest deal in the world, but it's still the biggest bottleneck on this device. And for that, if I were to use this in a pro scenario, I would definitely rather put it through a tube power amp and mic cabinet and use this as a preamp stereo effects processor. If you were to use one of the X3 products in a live environment direct to the board, uh, then one of the features you might want to take advantage of is the vocal processing, which can be helpful for, say, a lead singer who also plays guitar or a singer-songwriter with an acoustic guitar. Um, and, and that's one of those features that I, I found to be adequate on this. Uh, vocals is one of those things for me that very much relies on post-processing when recording. Um, and I would much prefer to use a dedicated unit for that uh, in a live environment because until you really dial in your own sound, you really don't know what vocals need until you hear them, uh, at least in a production sense for me. Um, you know, the, the guitar amp sound, everything this does, that's also kind of a blank slate in the same way that a voice is a blank slate. So all of the, the preamps, all the effects you can do are cool but I would still very much expect to have to do some tweaking after this unit, unless you just are perfect dialing in vocals. I'm, I'm not one of those people, but as you'll hear, it works. Um, it's definitely a, a cool feature to have, but uh, again, strays away from, I think, what the pod was originally all about. To round this video out, in short, I do like the X3 significantly better than the XT. It does what I want an amp modeler from this generation of hardware to do. Just having that pre-EQ stomp box model alone makes this so much better for down-tuned and extended range guitars, um, not to mention the added amp packs. 
honestly, in this day and age, and even if you hadn't invested in any pods at that point when it released, if you wanted one model pack or the effects junkie pack or anything, it was worth your while to just get the X3. And um, because of that, it's stood the test of time much better, I find, than a stock XT has. Um, but at the same time, it, it isn't much of a pod anymore, uh, especially by the time we get to the HD on the next video, then it's really going to, you know, look like a shadow of its former self, which is uh, actually fitting considering its color scheme. But even starting with the X3, the software capability, the input output options, really it's outgrown the pod form factor. And compared to the 1.0, 2.0, this barely even looks like a pod. Uh, especially look at the X3 Pro, the right mount version. You're looking at this 3U monstrosity compared to the uh, original Pod Pro. The input, output even dwarfs this, the effects loops and all that kind of stuff. And um, I think this really was a sign of things to come for Line 6 where they, they didn't much know what to do with Pod as a brand. It, it had diverged so dramatically from what the original was doing. Um, and in a way, that's a good thing because it still kind of makes the 1.0 and 2.0 worth having, in my opinion. I use it in such a different way. Uh, it doesn't really sound the same. And so for me, it's okay to still have like the 2.0 and the X3. Um, this is more of like a real guitar rig. It's not quite there but um, it, it does serve that function. And that leaves the XT in kind of this awkward middle child position that doesn't really fulfill either role perfectly. And, and by the time you throw more money at it to upgrade it, you're probably better off cutting your losses and just going for the added power and um, onboard functionality of the X3. And so for 2019 going forward, I think this is the better value. I think it's the better buy. It does cost a little more. But with all of those things we've talked about, it's a it's a much better uh, $100 spent versus spending $100 on model packs that should be free at this point. So if you're just now getting started in the recording, this is viable. Just be prepared to do some more post processing, impulse responses, um, you know, power amp simulation, post EQ. You can make it work. Plenty of albums have been released that sound really good with with this architecture. Um, and even as a backup unit, I think this is fine, you know, um, let's say X3 Live if you're doing a floorboard setup, but I would be okay playing with this in, you know, situations where guitar sound isn't necessarily the most critical thing, or even using this as a um, in audio interface if, you know, didn't have to play to a, a click track and that kind of stuff, because you could route basically everything through here. Um, so if you're looking into those kind of scenarios, then this might be a decent hidden gem for you for not all that much money. I have a feeling by the end of the Pod HD video, my sentiments won't be quite as positive, but as for the X3, I'm gonna hang on to this one. I, I actually quite like it, and uh, does those tones that I have a soft spot for. Probably use this in a, a cover or two, and with some manipulation, you can make it sound really good in uh, a more realistic manner. So that'll about do it, I believe, for today's Gear Curiosities. Please stick around for the upcoming Pod HD video as well as a kind of a finale shootout between the 2.0 X3 and HD. And I think at this point this warrants a separate video as well, talking about kind of my overall thoughts on the Pod series, what Line 6 could potentially do with that branding going forward, and what I'd like to see from them in general. So any questions, comments, as always, please leave them down below. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.